Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 4.9, which is a really interesting environmental phenomenon called the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So this is a periodic shift in atmospheric pressure, wind patterns, and ocean temperatures in the Southern Pacific. And so it's a cool way to end this unit because it builds on a lot of the other topics from unit four. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe the environmental changes and effects of El Nino and La Nina events which are the two extremes of the Southern Oscillation pattern. In order to do that, we need to know that these events involve changes in the Pacific Ocean surface temperature, global wind patterns, and ocean currents. We also need to understand that they're influenced by geological and geographical factors, and that they have different environmental impacts on different areas. Our suggested science skill for today is to describe environmental problems. So before we get into El Nino and La Nina, we have to look at some global ocean surface current patterns. So the first thing we'll discuss here is a gyre. A gyre is a large ocean circulation pattern that happens because of global wind patterns. And in the Northern hemisphere, they're gonna be clockwise, whereas in the Southern hemisphere, they're gonna be counterclockwise. So let's take a look at how global wind patterns cause these gyres to form. If we look on the map here, we'll see that between zero degrees and 30 degrees, wind patterns are gonna be moving water along the equator from east to west. Whereas when we get up to 30 degrees, between 30 and 60, we're going to have westerlies, which are going to blow these ocean surface waters from west to east. So we get these predictable patterns of clockwise rotation of surface currents in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise rotation in the southern hemisphere. And again, that's based on the prevailing wind patterns that are going to move ocean surface waters along the equator from east to west. And then as they start to move northward, they get directed by bodies of land. Then they get to 30 degrees where they switch directions from west to east. And they're just repeating these cycles here. There's another important topic we're going to talk about here in this map, which is upwelling. So if we look at these blue areas, we'll see upwelling zones. And these are areas where we have warm surface waters that are moving away from a land mass. So here we have warm surface water moving away from the coast of South America, here from the coast of North America. And what this does is brings colder water up from lower in the ocean to replace that warm surface water. Now the benefit of that is it brings up oxygen because cold water holds more oxygen than warm water. It also brings up sediments from deep in the ocean though which have nutrients. So along these upwelling zones, we're gonna see really productive fisheries. These are really productive fish populations where people will often make sources of income by catching the fish or have sources of food. Before we move on, there's one final thing I wanna call your attention to on this slide, and that's this region of the Southern Pacific here. So this area outlined in yellow is where we'll be focusing today. So I want you to remember that during normal conditions, we have Eastern trade winds that are blowing these surface waters from East to West. And so that's gonna move warm surface waters over towards Southeast Asia and Australia. And it's gonna to lead to this upwelling, which brings cooler water up to the coast of the Americas. That's gonna be really important to understand when we go forward to discuss what happens during an El Nino and La Nina event. Now we'll talk in a little more depth about the global mixing of the oceans. So the thermal haline circulation is this movement of ocean currents that connects all of the world's oceans and mixes salt, nutrients, and temperature throughout all of them. So as we discussed in the last slide, warm surface water moves east to west along the equator and then up into the Gulf of Mexico where it warms further. Then as it gets up to the 30 degree latitude, it's gonna be blown back from west to east by the westerlies. So as it moves back towards Europe, it's channeled up towards the North Pole. So as this warm Gulf stream flows north, some of the water evaporates, making it more salty since the salt can't evaporate with the water. It also cools and becomes more dense so that by the time it reaches the North Pole, it's much more dense due to both temperature and increased salt concentration. This causes it to sink. So if you look at the diagram on step two, we're switching from a red arrow to a blue arrow to signify that this water has sunk down to the ocean floor, where it's gonna mix around and spread out all over the ocean floor. So this is important because it distributes the salt in the ocean and the sediments, which have nutrients, and it even mixes the temperature of the ocean. What happens though is eventually, this cold, deep water is going to have to come back up to the surface, especially at these upwelling zones, where it's going to replace the warmer water that's being blown away from a landmass. This is gonna bring up colder temperature, 
nutrients and oxygen with it. And again, it just contributes to this global mixing of the world's oceans. The thermal haline circulation also has an important implication in moderating the temperature of different areas of the earth. So if we look at step one here, where this warm water from the Gulf of Mexico is moving northward, and then it starts getting blown from west to east by the westerlies and moves up past Europe, it's gonna bring some of this warm air that it's carrying and deposit it over Europe, which is gonna make the climate of Europe far warmer and much more moderate than climates at the same latitude that we find over in Canada. And so that's one way that this thermal haline circulation has an important effect on the climate of different regions. So now with the basics of global ocean circulation down, we can move on to ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So there's the tendency to simplify this concept into just an El Nino or La Nina event or normal conditions, but it's called the Southern Oscillation for a reason. So as we can see in the graph, what we really have is a constant fluctuation or oscillation back and forth between El Nino conditions, which bring warmer, rainier conditions to South America, and La Nina conditions, which bring cooler, drier conditions to South America. So I also want to point out that El Nino and La Nina events don't usually just happen solely in one year. So we call them events because they might peak in a given year, but they usually grow and then weaken over the course of a few years. So before we talk about an El Nino or a La Nina event, I just want to review the conditions that happen during a normal year or the neutral conditions. So normally we have trade winds that are going to blow from east to west in the equatorial region. And this is going to move the warm surface water of the ocean towards the west. It's going to shift it towards Australia and Southeast Asia. And because warmer water and warmer air has more moisture, that's going to lead to higher precipitation in this region. That also pulls cooler water up from the depths of the ocean to replace this warm surface water. And we can see that upwelling effect here. When the warm surface water is blown from east to west by these eastern trade winds, it's going to pull colder water up to replace it. Remember, colder water holds more oxygen. It also brings up sediments, which have nutrients. So that's why the coast of South America here is going to experience really productive fisheries during normal or neutral conditions. Because we have this warm air mass over here, that's going to be rising and expanding. This is going to create a low pressure system in the west. And that air is going to expand and sink back down and create a high pressure system over in the Americas. And that's what continues to drive these trade winds in the east to west direction. Now we'll look at an El Nino event. So the major, major indicator of an El Nino event is that the trade winds are weakening and they're actually going to reverse their direction. So they're no longer blowing from east to west, but they're going from west to east. What this does is shifts the concentration of warm surface waters towards the Americas. Now we're going to have cooler than normal conditions in Australia and Southeast Asia. Because of that, there's less rain. So we're actually going to see drought-like conditions potentially in Australia and Southeast Asia. This warmer water being shifted towards the Americas gives us milder winters in North America, but it's also going to lead to much, much rainier and warmer weather in the Americas, which can lead to flooding, and the big problem, especially in South America, is it's going to suppress the upwelling. So notice with this warm mass of surface water, we don't have that upwelling of the cold, deeper ocean water. So that's going to be a problem. It's going to really shut down those productive fisheries, and it's going to be really harmful to people that rely on fishing as a source of income or food, especially along the coast of South America. And lastly, we'll take a look at La Nina conditions now. So La Nina conditions are going to be stronger than normal trade winds. So this sees a reversal of the trade winds back to our east to west direction. And so that's going to shift the warmer surface waters back over to Australia and Southeast Asia. It's going to lead to even warmer than normal conditions there and even rainier than normal conditions there. So we may see flooding. We may see more intense monsoon activity in Southeast Asia. And it's going to lead to increased upwelling off the coast of South America. So in the Americas, we're gonna see cooler than normal weather, we're gonna see less rain and less precipitation than average, and we're gonna see especially productive fisheries due to this increased upwelling effect. So here we have a summary of the effects that El Nino and La Nina can have on different regions. 
So a really important takeaway from El Nino is that it brings warmer surface water to the west coast of the Americas, and that suppresses the upwelling of cold, deeper ocean water, especially in South America. And this can be devastating for fishermen who depend on the productive fisheries and for farmers who can often lose crops due to the flooding that's brought on by the especially rainy El Nino season. Farmers in Southeast Asia and Australia, meanwhile, may experience droughts due to the decreased rainfall that they see as the warmer Pacific waters are blown away from them and towards the Americas. Two positive impacts of El Nino, however, are that they typically weaken hurricane activity in the Atlantic, and they typically weaken monsoon activity in India and Southeast Asia. This also leads to typically a warmer, more mild winter in North America. La Nina, on the other hand, brings especially cold weather to the west coast of the Americas. This can lead to less precipitation in the Americas and can also increase tornado severity in the U.S. and hurricane activity in the Atlantic. Southeast Asia sees a return to the rainy conditions they're used to, which can be beneficial for agriculture, but it can also bring extreme flooding and an extreme increase in monsoon activity. All right, everybody, our practice FRQ for topic 4.9 today is to describe an environmental problem. So I'd like you to see if you can describe two environmental problems related to the conditions of an El Nino event. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful. Subscribe for future Apes video updates and check out other notes over here to the side. And as always, think like a mountain, write like a scholar. <laughs>